Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today, I rise to speak in support of my resolution uh, of disapproval under the Congressional Review Act against EPA's greenhouse gas regulation targeting existing power sources. I'm so proud to be here today with my colleague from uh, North Dakota, Senator Heidi Heitkamp. We have 47 co-sponsors on this bipartisan effort to stop the existing coal plant rule. We've had a lot of discussion about this. It affects all of our states uh, differently, but I think it's important to talk not just about what this does about to our individual states, but what this is going to do to us in a, as a country. If the administration's proposed clean power plan moves forward, hardship, hardship will be felt all across the country. Fewer job opportunities, higher power bills, and less reliable electricity will result. West Virginia and other coal-producing states like Kentucky and Wyoming are feeling the pain of prior EPA regulations. Nearly 7,000 more notices or notifications to employees. Does it, and let me just say, does everybody know what a warn notice is? If you've gotten one, you'll never forget it. Because basically what a warn notice says to that employee is that you could be laid off within the next 60 days. In West Virginia, 7,000 of those notices have gone out to West Virginia families, West Virginia coal miners in the year 2000. And more than 2,600 of those were just issued last month alone. Our neighboring state of Kentucky, state of the majority leader, lost more than 10% of its coal jobs during the first quarter of this year. Kentucky's coal employment now stands at the lowest level since the 1920s. The Energy Information Administration's most recent annual coal report for 2013 showed that the average number of coal mine employees dropped by roughly 10% in other coal producing states like Alabama, Utah, and Virginia. According to the Mine Safety and Health Administration, coal mining employment nationally has dropped by a massive 31% in just the last four years. And if you travel to the state of West Virginia, in particular our coal area, it doesn't take you long to see that. The impact of this war on coal extends far beyond the coal industry. These regulations are affecting all aspects of Americans' lives. Last month, West Virginia's governor announced that most state agencies would have to endure 4% cuts, largely because of shrinking energy tax revenues. For the first time in many years, the governor cut our education budget in the state of West Virginia because of this war on coal. That means less money for roads, for schools, and for health care services. But the terrible impact that prior regulations have had on West Virginia and, and the nation would get far worse if the EPA's Clean Power Plan goes into effect. The Clean Power Plan is the most expensive environmental regulation that the EPA has ever proposed on our nation's power sector. Compliance spending is estimated to total between $29 billion and $39 billion per year. Household spending power, the money that American families have in their pockets, will be reduced by $64 to $79 billion by this rule. And a new study by NERA, a respected economic analysis firm of the final rule, found that electricity prices in West Virginia would increase between 13 and 22 percent. But certainly West Virginia will not be alone, as we're going to hear through this debate, in enduring higher energy prices and job loss. NERA projects that all of the lower 48 states will see their electricity prices go up under the Clean Power Plan. As many as 41 states could see electricity prices increase by at least 10 percent. That's just from this regulation. And I'm sure my colleague from North Dakota is one of those affected states. 28 states would see electricity prices that would increase by at least 20 percent. And what does that mean for our economy? The National Rural Electric Cooperative Association found that a 10 percent increase in electricity prices could mean a loss of 1.2 million jobs across the country. Half a million of those jobs would be in rural communities, in rural states like West Virginia. North Dakota. The National Black Chamber of Commerce found that the Clean Power Plan would increase poverty among blacks by 23 percent and poverty among Hispanics by 26 percent. Affordable energy matters, especially to those living on fixed incomes. Households earning less than $38,000 or $30,000 a year spend an average of 23 percent of their income on energy costs. 
These families, these children, these workers, these elderly, they will be the ones who will suffer most under this administration policy. Energy reliability also matters. Coal is the source of our baseload generation, and the administration wants to replace coal with intermittent sources. Oh, what does that mean? Well, that means that on a hot day, when the air condition is running and factories are operating, we can be confident that a coal-fired power plant will be supplying the energy needed to cool our homes and keep our businesses running. In the cold winter of 2014, when the demand for electricity surged, coal was the energy source that re utilities relied on to keep people warm. Renewable sources, and we want more, we want more var variable ones and more frequent ones. Re renewable sources are an important part of our co country's energy mix. But there are always gonna be days when the wind just isn't blowing and the sun just isn't shining. And it's critical that we preserve more reliable energy resources to meet the demand of powering our economy. Where I'd like to see us go is innovation. Innovation, not across the board regulations, should be our focus. But these regulations will not spur innovation. The Clean Power Plan sets a standard for new plants that cannot be met by the most commercially available technology we have today. That not only flies in the face of the Clean Air Act, but also makes gradual improvements in technology that would improve our environment impossible to implement. The effect will be to instead choke off our most reliable and affordable source of energy and devastate the livelihoods of many folks around this country. Prior to this administration, our country did a laudable job in protecting and improving our environment while promoting economic growth. Last week marked the 25th anniversary of the 1990 Clean Air Amendments, which were signed into law by President H. W. George H.W. Bush and supported by senators across the political spectrum. Our air is now the cleanest it has been in decades. We continue, and we must continue, to reduce harmful pollutants like sulfur dioxide as our energy consumption increases and our population grows. Since 2005, U.S. carbon dioxide, car, excuse me, carbon dioxide emissions have fallen by 13%. According to the EIA, West Virginia has emitted 19% less carbon dioxide since the year 2000. We should continue on this track. We should continue to protect our environment, but not at the expense of our families, our communities, and our economy. I'm serious when I say, if you come to West Virginia, you'll see this easily. With this rulemaking, the EPA is attempting to oppose the same type of cap-and-trade system that Congress rejected five years ago. Having failed its attempt at cap-and-trade, the administration has taken a second bite at the apple by claiming authority under the Clean Air Act to impose a regulatory cap-and-trade program. That's not the way it's to be. This raises an obvious question. If EPA had cap-and-trade authority, as the administration's asserting now, why did the administration go to such lengths to try to pass cap-and-trade legislation? The answer is clear. The Clean Air Act does not authorize a mandatory cap-and-trade program. With its Clean Power Plan, EPA ignores 40 years of history and prior regulations that, consistent with the law, always based standards on controls installed at an existing plant. Let me be clear, in the 40-year history of the Clean Air Act, EPA has never issued an existing plant program quite like this. As one EPA official summed it up to the New York Times, and I quote, the legal interpretation is challenging, this effectively hasn't been done, end quote. Rather than regulating existing plants using the best technology, EPA, or yes, EPA is instead attempting to regulate the entire energy grid. This has not done but been done before because the Clean Power Act does not authorize EPA to do this. Both states and the private sector are doing what they can to fight back over this overreach. West Virginia is one of 27 states that has filed lawsuits to block this rule. Additionally, 24 national trade associations, 37 rural electric cooperatives, 10 major companies, and three labor unions representing over 800,000 employees are challenging the EPA's final clean power plan. In less than two weeks, international climate uh, negotiations will begin. The world is watching to see whether the United States 
will foolishly move toward move forward with costly regulations that will do virtually nothing to protect our environment. Under the Congressional Review Act, the Senate now has the chance to take a real up and down vote on whether the EPA's clean power plan can and should move forward. This is a legal binding resolution that if successful will pre prevent the clean power plan or similar rule from taking effect. Passing this regulation will send a clear message to the world that a majority of the U.S. Congress does not stand behind the President's efforts to address climate change with economically ca catastrophic regulations. Passing this regulation will also demonstrate to the American people that the Senate understands the need for affordable and reliable energy. Congress should pass this resolution and, and place this critical issue squarely on the President's desk. America's economic future is at stake here, and it is time to clear, send a clear signal that enough is enough. I'm very privileged to be offering this resolution with uh, Senator Heidkamp from North Dakota. She's been a champion in this issue. She has a different uh, energy mix in her state uh, and dinner, different energy concerns, but I think it goes to the heart of uh, North Dakotans and West Virginians about the economic uh, impact of such a very far-reaching and really um, uh, un, um, untried regulation in an area that is just so far-reaching. Far so I thank her again for her steadfast support, and it's been a, my pleasure to be working on this with you, Senator Heidkamp.